Hello everyone, Golden Nova here, and I'm happy to announce that we just might have another story for us to cover. We've talked about Dual Terminal, Albaz, and Visus, and now in the depths of ancient layers full of devious traps and priceless artifacts, a new tale is about to unfold. And we've also got another baddie that's gonna get a whole lot of fan art, which I think we can all enjoy. So, walk with me through this world forgotten by time as we catalog these dangers, both the cards and what they're based on, see if we can bring any friends along for the ride, and see if we can find out just how deep the rabbit hole goes. Don't get too excited about rolling the dice, because it's time for Snake Eyes Explain. So what in the world is going on with these cards? Well, normally when a new story is introduced, it takes a while for the archetypes to intermingle, but we're doing that right off the bat with not two, but three new themes. There's Diabelle Star, of which we only have the Dark Witch form, though I'm sure we'll be seeing many other versions in the future. There's the sinful spoils that she's after, providing a number of very powerful effects, and the creatures that protect her latest find, the Snake Eyes, which currently is the only set of these that have a coherent game game plan, that being the usage of several effects that put monsters in the spell and trap zone as continuous spells as a form of pseudo removal, before calling them to your side of the field as allies. Which is actually pretty messed up, because not only is that monster not leaving the field, thus depriving it of any sent to grave triggers, but it even seals up the spell and trap zone, and heaven help you if you're a pendulum pilot, haven't they suffered enough at the hands of Kashtira? But before we get into those, let's cover our new bodacious bounty hunter, since I'm sure they're going to be very important moving forward. Diabelle Star, the Dark Witch, is a level 7 Dark Spellcaster monster with 2500 attack and 2000 defense, so close to that Dark Magician stat line. You can special summon this card from your hand by sending one other card from your hand or field to the grave, and you can only special summon this monster once per turn this way. If this card is normal or special summoned, you can set a Sinful Spoils spell or trap card directly from your deck, and if this card is sent from the hand or field to the grave during your opponent's turn, you can send a card from your hand or field to the grave, and if you do, special summon this card. These last two are both hard once per turns, and they're both very strong. Having an option to revive Diabelle, which in turn gets you another Sinful Spoils, is out of this world, and I'm sure a number of decks are foaming at the mouth for a chance to use this card as a way to trigger any grave effects they might have. Not to mention that 7 is becoming a very popular level nowadays, making for great Ixies and Synchro material. And because this doesn't apply any kind of restriction, this can be splashed into almost anything while giving you access to some cool support cards, so keep that in mind for later when we talk about the Sinful Spoils, or really any archetype that involves this in the future. I wouldn't be surprised if this was the Albaz or Visas of the lore moving forward, meaning they'll be the Dia Bell star of the ball. Next up, let's talk about these Snake Eye monsters, the first three of which have pretty similar and useful effects. Snake Eye White Birch is a level 1 fire pyro monster with 0 attack and 2100 defense, and if you control a fire monster, you can special summon this card from your hand, which you can only do once per turn. During your opponent's turn as a quick effect, you can send this card and one other face-up card you control to the grave to special summon a Snake Eye monster from your hand or deck, except a copy of this card. Snake Eye Excel has the same type, level, and attribute, has 800 attack and 1000 defense, and if normal or special summoned, you can add a level 1 fire monster from your deck to your hand. It also has the same special summon effect as White Birch, but isn't a quick effect, and can only be done during your turn. The last of this trio is Snake Eye Orc, which also sports the same type, level, and attribute, has 900 attack and 200 defense, and if normal or special summoned, you can target one of your level 1 fire monsters that are either banished or in the grave and special summon it. And Orc also has the exact same summon effect as Excel. This gives you a pretty nifty line of play where you summon Excel, search White Birch, then special summon it, using Excel's effect to send both to summon Orc, which in turn revives the White Birch, setting up the next monster we're going to talk about after this. But not only does this help out our deck, but Excel gives us options to work with other great cards as well. While the level 1 fire monster pool is very shallow, it's not without its highlights. It can get you any number of Infernobles, Infernoids Pyramace and Decatron, Jet Synchron, Kurakara Div Incarnate for that new age kaiju power, and to fit with the pyrotyping, Volcanic Shell. And because the card you sent to grave for the summon effect just has to be face up, once again, you can slot this into a lot of decks without having to worry about stepping on their toes. With my only complaint being being that their lack of diverse, unique effects makes them kind of bland. But that's the kind of thing you give up when you aim to be the best around, and I can tell they've got that drive. 
because they've got that fire in their eyes. Next up is the big payoff for these burning bumblers, Snake Eyes Flamberge Dragon, a level 8 fire dragon monster with 3000 attack and 2500 defense, once again, so close to blue eyes. It can target a monster in any grave or face up on the field and place it face up in its owner's spell and trap zone as a continuous spell card. And during your opponent's turn, you can target a monster card on the field, treat it as a continuous spell, and special summon it to your field. And if this card is sent from the hand or field to the grave, you can special summon and two level 1 fire monsters from your grave. Wow, uh, this card is awesome, no two ways about it. We'll have other cards that put monsters in the spell and trap zone, but the fact that Flamberge handles that all on its own is very nice. And because you can do this to both players' graves, you've got a lot to pick from. It's especially good if it has any on summon effects, because during your opponent's turn, you can spring it on them whenever you want. But keep in mind that these effects don't work on every monster in the spell and trap zone, just ones treated as continuous spells. So while you can potentially snipe Crystal Beast and Valances in those matchups, you can't grab Plunder Patrols since those are treated as equal equip cards. The floating effect is also really nice because you can get back white birch and because it's a quick effect you can send the other revived monster to grave to summon another flam burst dragon. Heck you can summon orc alongside it to revive excel for a search as well. Also notice that its floating effect works anytime it's sent from the hand or fuel to the graveyard. Meaning that if you put this in your spell and trap zone with another copy of Flamberge, or any other number of effects we'll talk about later, you can trigger this effect by feeding the other effects in your deck that need you to send cards to the grave. This is a really solid boss monster with a super cool effect, and I look forward to using its power to put our opponent on the burge of defeat. That does it for our monsters, now it's time for the spells and traps. Starting us off, we have a card that actually came out in the set prior to the rest of them because the R&D team is a bunch of cheeky monkeys. Sinful Spoils of Subversion Snake Eye is a normal spell card that targets a face-up monster on the field and places it face-up in its owner's spell and trap zone as a continuous spell. Yup, we've stolen Crystal Beast's Thunder, now you can crystallize any monster. Now, obviously, turning your opponent's monsters into a zone lock is pretty nifty for reasons stated previously, but there are a number of other funny applications you can do with this. For instance, this has a lot of potential in Mech Knights. Since you choose the zone the card is placed in, if your opponent has two monsters, you can tuck one of them below the other, and now you have a very profitable blue sky column with your opponent unable to play around it. You could also use it in Magical Musket, not only as a spell to activate their effect, but you can put your opponent's monster in the back row for when you make max, giving you another monster you can summon off of that effect if you're not looking to search the Magical Musket spells. You could even use this in Battery Man to effectively remove two monsters off the board off of Industrial Strength's effect. You can also use this on your own card, so there's a chance that Crystal Beast and Valance might use this as a way to complement their own strategy, though I'm not sure how useful it actually is. The decks already have really good engines for accomplishing that mission. This card is kinda bonkers, but in that kind of way where it has very particular, not exceedingly powerful applications. But don't be surprised if this shows up as the surprise tech pick of the format, so make sure you don't lose sight of it. The original Sinful Spoils Snake Eye is a normal spell card that sends one other face-up card you control to the grave to special summon a level 1 fire monster from your hand or deck. You can also banish this card from your grave, then target a Snake Eye or Dia Bellstar monster in your grave. You add a level 1 fire monster from your deck to your hand, then place the targeted monster on the bottom of the deck, and you can only use one effect per turn, and only once per turn. So on initial activation, this is another way to get the Excel line going as long as you have a face-up card you're willing to give up, and while in the grave, it's a searcher that recycles an on-theme card. This is A-plus support, no doubt about it, basically doing everything you want an enabler to do. That last Sinful Spoil is cool, but the sequel is never going to be good as the original. The Sinful Spoils Hunter Fiend is a quick play spell card that adds a Dia Bellstar monster from your deck or grave to your hand. And during your main phase, you can banish this card from your grave, then target a Sinful Spoils spell or trap card that is banished or is in your grave, except a copy of this card, to place it on the bottom of your deck, then draw a card. So this gets you more copies of Dia Bellstar, and while we only have one at the moment, this is only going to get better as we get more targets. And it also comes with a recycling effect, even getting you back your banished Sinful Spoils so you can make full use of them before getting them back into rotation. Once again, amazing card, not just for the effect, 
but also for the visual gag. The poorly drawn wanted poster is easily one of my favorites. Sinful Spoils of Doom, Luciella is a quick play spell card that targets a level 7 or higher spellcaster monster you control and applies the following effects in sequence. That face-up monster is unaffected by other monster's effects this turn, but send it to the grave during the standby phase of the next turn, and all face-up monsters your opponent currently controls lose attack equal to that monster's attack. Then, if any of those monsters' attack has been reduced to zero as a result, destroy it. Wow, this card is bonkers, I love it! Use Luciella on your own turn, and not only do you have a monster that's not going to get touched by most pieces of interaction, it's also a board wipe, clearing anything with 2500 or less attack, and making anything bigger than that extremely vulnerable to battle. Now, losing Diabelle Star might seem like a bug, but it's actually a feature. Make sure you use it on your own turn, and when it's sent to the grave during the next standby phase, it'll do so during your opponent's turn, enabling the revival effect of our hunter, which in turn gets us another search. But because the requirement is just level 7 or higher spellcasters, you could tech this in to a number of other decks, if you find you need the raw removal. Heck, I'm sure Dark Magician will love the opportunity to get Tall, Dark, and Handsome into the grave so Eternal Soul can revive it again for that Dark Magic Circle removal. It'll really make their Dooms Day. The Shrine of Serpentine Sight Snake Eye is a field spell card that, when activated, places a Snake Eye monster from your hand, deck, or grave face up in its owner spell and trap zone as a continuous spell. Level 1 fire monsters you control gain 1100 attack, very cute, and once per turn, if your opponent normal or special summons any number of monsters except during the damage step, you can target a monster on the field treated as a continuous spell and special summon it to your field. So hey, now you have another instance of Flamberge's effects, that's pretty cool. And setting up your back row with the Snake Eye is actually really good, because now that's a free card you can send to the grave with almost any of our effects for free. Not to mention that it helps or get through your combos if you don't have anything else to work with. Speaking of those though, the 1100 point boost is outrageous, turning Excel into a 1900 point level 1 and Orc into a 2000. And here I thought they were just going to be dungeon fodder. Guess things get a bit more serious when in the raid boss's domain. The Glaring Ruler Snake Eyes is a normal trap card that you can activate if the total levels of all Snake Eye monsters you control equal two or more. And you get to pick one of two effects. Either target a monster in your opponent's grave or face-up field and place it in its owner's spell and trap zone face-up as a continuous spell, or target a monster card on the field treated as a continuous spell and special summon it to your field. So it's... just more of Flamberge's effect. Hmm. You know, uh, I'm gonna be honest, I was kinda hoping some of these would be a bit more interesting. I mean, the activation condition is kind of funny, asking you to have either the big boss itself or two of the smaller ones. You know, cause they have two eyes. But it's just more of the same. It adds consistency and redundancy, sure, but it also means these aren't covering any weaknesses the deck might have, which I feel is a glaring oversight. Sinful Spoils of Betrayal Sylvia is a normal trap card that sends a Diabelle Star monster from your hand or face-up field to the grave, then targets a face-up card on the field and negates its effects. And when your opponent activates a card or effect in response to the activation of your Diabelle Star monster's effect or Sinful Spoil Spell and Trap card or effect, you can banish this card from your grave to negate the opponent's effect, but you can only use one effect per turn, and only once per turn. So now you get a little bit of negation thrown in there, and is another outlet for summoning Diabell Star if you use this on your opponent's turn. And because this can target any face-up card on the field, you can even negate normal spells and traps if you chain to them, which is super awesome, letting you hit cards that you otherwise wouldn't be able to respond to, like Dark Ruler No More, and the occasional Forbidden Droplets if they didn't pitch a trap card for it. And remember, Diabell Star is supremely splashable, so it might be worth it to run it in your deck just to access this card to combat those kinds of threats. All in all, this is a fantastic card, and it even has that hint of whimsy that we've seen from previous cards. Yeah, Sylvia looks like a huge Bloodborne boss chomping away, and Diabelle is channeling that sweet, sweet Ecto Cooler, but Flamberge looks like it's doing the anime pain howl, which is very delightful. Alright, so that's all the cards we have so far, but before we get into the tech picks, what in the world is going on here? If this is the new lore archetype, what's the story? Well, like most of these stories when things start up, details are very sparse. We're gonna need future sets to flesh out the setting, but here are a few things of note now that I've had some time to stew on them, on top of now having access to the recently released reference arts. On top of Snake Eye, Luciella and Sylvia are also sinful spoils, but they aren't just magical artifacts, they are living, 
breathing creatures. Notice that green furry claw draped over Dia Bellstar's shoulder and the little bat hand over her right hip? Well, those are Luciella and Sylvia in their low-powered state, acting as companions during day-to-day -day life before becoming powerful weapons in combat. And we know this because of that reference art I talked about earlier, showing Sylvia painting her nails, Luciella putting a blanket on Dia Bellstar. They're all just kind of a little family, it's very cute. But that begs the question. How did she come into the possession of these sinful spoils? The parasitic dynamic means she probably wasn't born with it, especially since other sinful spoils exist outside of these two as evidenced by the existence of a snake eye, so I think it's safe to say that Diabelle is out on a mission to hunt down all the sinful spoils. For what reason? I can't say, but it's probably a pretty darn good one, since she doesn't seem to be afraid of running afoul of the authorities to do so. Because I don't think a random treasure hunter would get a wanted poster made of them, no matter how shoddy it might be, which implies that not all the sinful spoils are in secluded ruins. Either Luciella, Sylvia, or both were owned by someone or something, Dia Bellstar took the liberty of borrowing them, and now the authorities are after them. But since the two new friends seem amicable enough, the spoils might actually be happy to have been taken. There's also the possibility that that our protagonist has more spoils that they've yet to show. The reference art says that the color green is meant to show the parts influenced by these sinful spoils, and another part of her that has that color are the tips of her hair, as well as her right eye, though only when she's wearing the Omen half mask. However, what she has in store for Snake Eye now that it's been captured, or what else she has plans to do, is currently a bit of a mystery. However, we do have a bit of info in regards to the Snake Eyes. See, their names are derived from an old Lithuanian folktale, Egil, the Queen of Grass Snakes. There's a number of tellings, but one recurring aspect is that Egil has four children. Three of them are sons named after trees, Oak, Ash, and Birch, which line up with our level ones, Orc, Excel, and White Birch. Uh, the Excel one seems a little strange, but it's named after a kind of ash tree called Fraxinus Excelsior. The fourth child is a daughter named for the Aspen tree, so expect a fourth member of the team in a future set. Another interesting tidbit I picked up is that Egil goes home to visit her family, who were upset because her husband, Zilvinus, the grass snake prince, essentially tricked her into marrying him and took her away from them. So they trick Zilvinus into leaving his palace, at which point the family ambushes the prince and kills him with scythes, which appear to be what Luciella's art is referencing. Referencing. That's pretty cool, and does imply that Flamberge is Zilvinus, which means we still don't know where the Queen is. Unless there's some piece of information that I haven't picked up on. Oh, and while it may seem strange to the Pokemon attuned members of my audience for the big fire dragon to be associated with grass snakes, there are sacred animals of Saul, a sun goddess, so there's that. At this point, I predict we'll be seeing more of Dia Bellstar's escapades, gaining more sinful spoils based on other mythologies, and eventually we'll get a rival faction dead set on hunting down the hunter. But we'll see if this has the same kind of appeal as other lore archetypes. But as for me, I'm excited. I'm also very sad we have to wait three whole months for the next set. I want spoilers now! Seriously, Konami, please, please let me, please let me do previews for your sets. Please let me talk about the lore archetypes. I have a desperate, desperate need for it. I, I, I need it. Okay, so that's all I have to say about these cards, mechanically and through lore. But what do we actually do with them? Well, with the kinds of things you can do with Dia Bellstar, I don't think a full-on deck is in the cards right now, but could make its way into a variety of other themes. As for Snake Eyes, it also feels like it's better as an extra little tool that decks can make use of as opposed to making it its own deck, since its whole identity right now seems to just be make big dragon and steal stuff. So we'll be on the lookout for cards that give this deck a bit more of a solid game plan, or discovering what deck Decks could use a little aggro power. So what can we play to help them out? Well, I think the biggest piece of support to keep in mind right now is Bonfire. This recently released Rota for Pyro Monsters gets us all of our level 1 Snake Eyes, meaning we have yet another way to get Excel combos going. One for One is also a way to supplement the original Snake Eyes spell, but can only send monsters as its cost, so it can be a bit bricky in certain hands. If we use Bonfire, it's probably best to make sure we include some other targets. Like we mentioned previously, decks that run level 1 Pyro Monsters on its own are best, and that's where Volcanic Shell comes in. It makes the perfect card to send to Grave for your effect since it gets you a replacement for a small chunk of change, but you can also use Bonfire to get Volcanic Rimfire, which can enable more Volcanic and Blaze Accelerator plays, though you could also search Volcanic Rocket instead if you need a Blaze Accelerator card that bad. And let's not forget that it also grabs Barrier Statue of the Inferno if you want a little Floodgate action. 
Flamberge can put your own monsters in the spell and trap zone on their way to being revived, but that leaves them vulnerable to back row removal. However, you won't have to worry about that once we get our hands on the Link 2 Flame Tongue the Blazing Magical Blade. Not only does it require two fire monsters as material, lining up perfectly with our deck, it keeps our face-up spells and traps from being destroyed by our opponent's card effects. And if any of your fire monsters get banished, this can grab them right back. Not bad for a Gallant Mon lookalike. As for a silly tech pick, Artifacts. Now, they only special summon themselves when destroyed while set during your opponent's turn, but that's totally fine. While Scythe may be banned, thank goodness, we can still put Moral Talk in the back row and summon it during our opponent's turn to pop a card. Alternatively, we can get Lancey into rotation, using it turn after turn to keep our opponent from banishing cards. And having the ability to shut off an entire mechanic like that, in my opinion, is pretty ridiculous. And I'm saying that as a branded player. Can Labyrinth please stop cycling to Mention Barrier. I'm so upset. And that's all I have to say about Snake Eyes. We've got an interesting pool of cards so far, and I can't wait to see where it goes from here. The main game plan is basic, to say the least, but its reliability could prove to be its greatest strength. And with Diabelle Star providing some much needed coverage, I wouldn't be surprised if we got a really powerful wave of support in the next few sets, which will really spoil us. But now, I want to hear what you all have to say. Are Snake Eyes looking pretty good, or are these tree-themed fire spirits a bit too truncated to use? And what kind of lore theories do you have cooking up in there? Tell me your thoughts in the comments, and while you're down there, make sure you like, subscribe, and share this video with somebody you know who loves Yu-Gi-Oh! It really does a lot to help me out. Today's episode was brought to you in part by Dragon Shield. When you want to protect your cards with the power of dragon scales, get some sweet lore for them, and support the channel, check out my link in the description to get started. Today's episode was also brought to you by my lovely patrons, including the illustrious Quasar Commander Green Knight, Nebula Navigator's Third Dynasty, Ada Basilisk, Adam Zagdell, Andrew Newman, A Random Pup, Avi Chali, Kane Senpai, Chibi Gohan, Clockswork, Danny Bound, Eric, Aaron the World Breaker, Frankie, Garland Chaos, Genesis Yu-Gi-Oh, Gloomba 331, Great Big Pillock, Hair Bear, Harry the Ominous Benefactor, Howling Zangetsu, Iskander 711, John, Julius Sneezer, Mana Charge, Marluxia is a Girl, Molly Renata, Nathan Vig, Orozco 09096, Panther J, Rebel King Lucifer, RJ the Jank Monarch, Sammy Haim, Sir Knight JCB, Sky Buster Leo, Sophie, apparently, The Wizard Moose and Xander Wolfensberger, Cosmic Crusaders Almento 5010, Ariel Kersey, Beluga Masta, Blue Gem, Callum McCann, Chaz Ghost, Corbinisms, Drakenwald, Drake and SpongeBob be like, you used to call me on your shell phone, Eki Bullock, Emony, Eva Padilla, Hike Boyajian, Herbal D, Inblink, Jester Designs, Kale the Dragon, Carp, Kivon Public, King Scarlet Yu-Gi-Oh, Lemon Yu-Gi-Oh, Lord whoop de doo Manga Pages, Marion James E. Picotta, Matt Simmons, Mega Combi, Michael Shimabukuro, Nadia McCarthy, Nitromo, Ruxith Sarani, Shizuka Nijimura, Star Lord 777, Stephen Williamson, The Legendary Raven, Tucker Ordorn, Venusian Teapot, and Zaldreka, as well as the wonderful Starlight Explorers you see on screen now. If you'd like to be a part of these credits, help me in my journey to cover all of Yu-Gi-Oh's archetypes, get my videos early, and participate in the monthly custom card reviews, I would be eternally grateful if you checked out my Patreon in the description or joined up as a YouTube member. And if you want to see some more pyro powerhouses, check out this video I made covering volcanics. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye bye